So let's pick up our part two, right where we left off on part one, um, taking a look at how viruses can grow. Uh, our example here was to grow bacteriophages, and of course they grow inside of bacterial cells. All of that's fairly simple to do. Um, you spreading out bacteria on a petri plate, and then they would normally grow a full lawn of bacteria, but wherever the virus infects the bacteria, um, the bacteria will die, and you will see that as a plaque or a zone of clearing, as you can see right here. Uh, there are several that are shown on this um, petri plate, all these little holes um, in the lawn of bacteria. Those are plaques full of viruses uh, that have killed the bacterial cells. So now let's take a look at how viruses could grow in um, animal tissue. So those would be viruses that are infecting uh, eukaryotic cells. And the traditional method of growing viruses would be um, in embryonated eggs. Um, so the virus will be injected into the egg and then the viral growth is signaled by changes or the death of the embryo. Um, the traditional way would be there are various places where you could inject the um, viral solution to infect this embryonated egg. And as some shown right here, um, amniotic inoculation is very common, but you can also do the yolk sac or any of the where the syringes are shown here. And then um, the viruses will grow on the membrane at the inoculation site. So one other thing to point out about um, growing viruses in embryonated eggs is it's fairly easy to do. Um, it's relatively inexpensive, and this is still the traditional way of how most vaccines are being made. And so uh, when you're getting a flu shot, you might be asked if you're allergic to eggs um, because this is um, how a lot of the flu vaccines are still being made. So a lot of viruses are also grown in tissue cultures or cell cultures. So there um, you can um, treat the cells in various ways and then infect them with the virus. And you take a look at the cytopathic effect that the virus has on the cells. And uh, you can basically transform um, cell lines and then continuously grow viruses in your tissue culture. And what that might look like is shown here on the next slide. So that would mean that the tissue is treated with enzymes first, separating out the cells, and then the cells are suspended in the culture medium right here. They're grown on the bottom here. And then um, you can uh, infect the tissues, the, the cells with the virus. And here you have shown here some transformed cells that are continuously growing the virus. So this slide here shows the uh, cytopathic effect that a virus can have. Over here, panel A, those would be normal human cells, cervical cells in this case. And um, over here, panel B, um, these cells have been infected with a virus. Uh, it was HHV2. And um, you can see how the cells are completely different. This uh, pink cell here now has... Um, um, many nuclei and they're all filled up with virus particles. So you can use the cytopathic effect that a virus has um, in order to identify what type of virus it is. Um, there are other methods as well and a lot of people talk about testing these days for the coronavirus. So um, common ways of uh, testing for a virus would be either by, with the cytopathic effect that it has on the cells serological tests, that means you're looking for antibodies. So that means the immune system has already reacted to the virus and now uh, has made antibodies and then you can detect um, the virus with the antibodies, either directly or indirectly. And um, nucleic acid detection, that is uh, a faster, very uh, sensitive way of um, viral identification. Uh, there are two ways you can use RFLPs, that stands for Restriction Fragment Length Polymorphisms. That means you're cutting up the DNA or RNA of the virus with enzymes and are looking for the pattern of bands that are being generated in a gel electrophoresis. Also very popular and probably the most popular test these days would be PCR testing because it's quick and easy and relatively inexpensive. So PCR stands for Polymerase Chain Reaction. And that is very sensitive, very fast, and a preferred method of viral identification. 
So if you are growing viruses either in your body or in a tissue culture or wherever the virus is growing, um, a typical viral one-step growth curve is shown here on the slide. And there you have um, the number of infectious particles that first enter the tissue cells. At first it was high and goes down because the virus takes some time to uh, manufacture more of itself. And that takes... Um, various amounts of time, sometimes days, sometimes even longer than that, um, sometimes it's just hours. And uh, whenever the viral particles are ready to leave the cell, they're bursting out of the cell, typically killing the cells, and then the viral load um, will skyrocket. It goes up exponentially, and that is known as the acute infection time. And then typically the immune system will respond and uh, make antibodies. Now, if the virus multiplies fast and kills fast, then the immune system might lose out, and that obviously is not a good thing. So let's take a look at how these uh, viruses will grow inside of living cells. The easiest way to start is usually taking a look at how a virus multiplies in a prokaryotic cell, so in a bacteria. And so we're gonna take a look at first at the typical multiplication of a bacterial phage, a virus that infects bacteria. Uh, in this case, we have two distinct life cycles, um, the lytic cycle versus the lysogenic cycle. So in the lytic cycle, the virus causes lysis and death of the host cell because it actively multiplies, producing more of itself and um, eventually bursting the host cell, killing it. The lysogenic cycle is sort of this dormant stage where the DNA of the virus is present in the bacterium, in the host DNA, but um, it's being multiplied but whenever the bacterium divides, but there's no real active um, producing of the, of the virus. And this, um, let's take a look at the lytic cycle specifically. So this would be the active reproducing life cycle of a bacterial phage. And it goes to these stages of attachment, penetration, next, then biosynthesis, maturation, and release. So first, uh, the virus needs to attach to the host cell. It's doing this with the tail fibers and inject the DNA into the host cell, so right here. So the DNA injected into the host cell, and then we need to make more viral particles. That would be include the viral DNA, proteins, the protein coat, and all of the parts that the this complex virus needs. And then we need to assemble the phage particles, and then release them from the host cell. So here's the slide that goes along with this. So here we have attachment first. So your little space shuttle lands on the surface of the bacterium in this case here. So it's complex virus, bacteriophage attaches. Then penetration is part two. It will inject the DNA into the bacterium right here. And then number three, biosynthesis. Now we need to uh, make more viral particles. That includes everything that the virus needs. And then uh, we need to assemble these parts to make more functioning virus particles. So here is a little bit larger. You need to assemble the pieces, almost like playing with Legos, just putting the parts together. Uh, of course, the DNA needs to go into the head portion, and we need to attach the neck and then the tail fibers. And here we have complete viral particles. They're ready to launch and burst out of the cell. Usually bacterial cells, uh, they burst open, they're so filled up with viruses. Um, once the, uh, the virus bursts out of the cell, the cell dies. So by comparison, the lysogenic cycle of a bacteriophage is pretty boring um, because nothing really happens. The DNA gets incorporated into the host cell DNA and um, it gets replicated every time the bacterium divides and it just stays there in a dormant kind of stage. A lot of times the uh, presence of the DNA, of the phage DNA uh, in the bacterium results in something that's known as phage conversion and the host cell uh, sort of has new properties. So let's take a look at this one more time. Here we have the lysogenic and the lytic cycle on the same slide here. 
Um, well, let's do what Totora does. We'll start with one number one. So we're here in the in the lytic cycle of the virus. Um, first is attachment, of course. So the virus will attach itself to the surface and inject its genetic material into the um, host cell. The viral genome is shown right here. So that's the more pink kind of um, DNA circle right here. When it comes to, when we continue on the lytic cycle, we will be incorporating um, this um, the genome or the DNA into the fully into the integrated into the host cell and then direct the instruct the host cell to make more viral particles and that starts with manufacturing of all the parts that the virus needs. Uh, then we need to assemble the viral particles and um, then eventually once the host cell is completely filled up with viral particles and they have matured then they will be released and they come out right here so and then they can go on and infect another uh, set of bacterial cells and go on and do the same thing over and over so that's the lytic cycle in the lysogenic cycle so now we're going over this way into the green part so now the pink dna from the virus gets incorporated here into the host cell genome and becomes part of it and um, every time the bacterium divides it will copy the viral dna along with its own dna and so we'll just continue to do that a lot of times these uh, bacteria undergo then this phage conversion they have different properties and Depending on the conditions, um, the um, lysogenic cycle could actually switch over and go right into the lytic cycle. So that's possible. So here's another interesting thing to know. Um, bacteria, they can actually use a, a virus, a bacteriophage, as a vehicle. And so they can... Uh, transfer bacterial genes that they want to share with another bacterium and they can use a virus to sort of um, transport those genes that they want to share to another um, bacterium and um, this can also be used in lab settings where you can then transfer, transfer genetic information from one bacterium to another and so that would be called transduction of genetic material in this case and it does change the genetic properties of the bacteria. So here is a diagram that shows what happens during transduction. Um, here we have first um, the viral genes in pink again that are part of the bacterial genome and now we're using uh, the pink um, portion here together with some of the purple from the bacterial gene and put that into the virus head. So you see how there is a pink portion that's viral uh, genes and then we have the in purple those are bacterial genes and now this virus goes on to the to infect the next bacterium right here on four and there we have this bacterium now has both the viral genes in pink and from this other bacterium it has the the um, purple genes as well and then, so and as a result down here then in the end you have a bacterium <clears throat> that has now new properties because it has received this um a purple gene from another bacterium. So before we move on to take a look at animal or virus multiplication in cells, um, <clears throat> let's take a look at um, the comparison. Uh, again, everything of course is easier when you're dealing with bacteria. So bacterial phages, they will have to attach to their host cell, inject the viral DNA into the host cell, um, there is no nucleus to worry about, so they will just start um, using the host cell um, ribosomes uh, to make more viral particles, whatever they need, and um, use all of the host cell uh, enzymes to make more viral particles, and then the host cell eventually is lysed. Now, if we're taking a look at animal viruses, here you can see that... Um, they are dealing with a nucleus where they have to usually get the um, the genetic material into. And we will take a closer look at how some of the detail of this works. It's quite different in DNA versus RNA viruses. Uh, sometimes you are dealing also with something called a latency period. Um, and then it also really depends on whether you have envelope viruses, non-envelope viruses, and whether they can do some replication in cytoplasm or in the nucleus.